a series, we talked about new creation. And we talked about how we as Christians, we, we live this life with the hopes of heaven. In other words, this is just kind of a, a period in time where we wait to get to something bigger and better, which is heaven. Now, this morning, we're going to kind of take another twist on that. Now, one thing I've found in ministry that, that we as Christians, we tend to spiritualize what we believe. We, we tend to give it more of a spiritual influence. What I mean by this is that if I have asked you what the goal, what your goal as a Christian is to be, nine out of ten people in here would say it is to get to heaven. Now, in the times of the early Christians, the first Christians, the first Christians that were, were after Christ, if I were to ask them the same question, they would say it is their goal to get to the resurrection, which is two complete opposite things. It is true that our souls will, will go to heaven, and that is true that it is something we look forward to in this life, but the early Christians they knew that there was something even bigger than heaven. See, if the story of God, if the story of Christ, if the story of His ascension had ended at the ascension, then that story really wouldn't mean as much to us. The Scripture tells us that the same bodies that we will have on now, although free from corruption and sin, will again be ours. That we will walk, that we will talk, that we will feel, that we will hear, we will, we will touch once again. We will even be ourselves once again. Even better, we will be in a new world. So we started this off talking with a new creation. How we are made new, and today we end this series in a new world. A new life. Jesus referred to this paradise in Luke 23, 42, when he says this, Truly I tell, I tell today, you will be with me in paradise. Paul in Romans said that creation waits eagerly, expecting something. Right now there are thorns in the ground, Paul would go on to say, but the thorns will be removed. And then again, we look at the words and joy to the world. No more let sin or sorrow grow. No thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow far as curse is found. But the fixing doesn't start in the resurrection. See, the fixing in our lives, the removal of the thorns in our lives, the thorns in the ground starts now. As we walk, as we talk, as we smell, as we see, as we experience the world all around us, we are doing so in a world that will be restored to its original intention. There was a TV show on, I don't know if, if many, many of you remember this, it was called The Mentalist. Did anyone ever watch that? Raise your hand if you, you ever watched The Mentalist. Brian did? Yeah. All right, a couple of you watched The Mentalist. If you remember The Mentalist, the character, I don't know if it's still on or not, but the, the character, he was a very secular guy. Um, and as he, he, he goes on through the, the, the series, he believes that death is the final and end point of our lives, that, that there's no form after death, and he, he, the evidential cause of death is, is your ending. There's no existence in any form past that. And even though he thought this way, um, this was all because his wife was murdered in the, in the very early part of the series. His wife was murdered, and, and Patrick, the main character, he had thought that, um, that that was the ending point of that, that after that nothing was meaningful to this. But then he meets this other woman, and he becomes to, to become very attracted to her, and this other woman is a, a lady of faith. So all throughout the series, they, um, she believes to explain her reality of death, that, that death um, is the sin and death would not be defeated in the future, is how she explains it. 
that she believes in the resurrection of Christ. Now, I, I tell you all this because the thing I like most about this show is how they explained the two contrasting differences. How one person could believe that death is the very last form and how the other person could believe that death is only the death of sin and corruption. And how the two could still be attracted to one another. See, even Hollywood struggles dealing with this. Even Hollywood knows that there's a very specific gray line that has to be crossed sometimes as we make Hollywood pictures. For the past month or so, we've been talking about how these, all these different ways that we've been created new and how our lives expand into new creation. We've been talking about these ways that the resurrection has made us new. See, every culture has some sort of explanation on, on what the afterlife, the next life, means to us. In Islam, they believe that if you're martyred, that you will, you will receive many benefits in the next life, in the future paradise, if you would. In Hindu, they believe that, that the purifying of the soul would mean a million reincarnations that would eventually get you to nirvana. Now, I'm not talking about the 90s rock band nirvana. I'm talking about the peace of nirvana. But our hope as Christians is found in the victory over death that is the resurrection. Because of Jesus, because of who he is, of what he did, that we have faith in the resurrection. Now let's get back to the reading for today. In the reading for today, Jesus has received the news that Lazarus is dead. Now, if you remember, Jesus and Lazarus are, are pretty good pals. They're good friends. So upon receiving the news that Lazarus is dead, you would think that, that he would like to run back to Judea and, and see what's going on and see his dear friend and, and even maybe have the chance to save him. But as he's talking with his disciples prior to this, the disciples are kind of warning him against going back there. Because Jesus is, is a hated man in Judea. They know that there's a chance that, that he too could get killed by going back to seeing Nazareth, or Lazarus. So he stands there for a couple days and he's trying to show the disciples exactly what it means to, to be there. And he's trying to maybe, maybe persuade the disciples to go in with them. So Jesus, he, he kind of gives this, this taste of, this is ultimately what the most important thing to do is. Jesus is giving the disciples a taste of this. Now Martha is the first to meet Jesus when he, he arrives there, and Martha kind of gives him a little scolding. Martha runs up to him, he says, Jesus, if you were here a couple days ago, Lazarus could be alive yet. Where were you? Why weren't you, you here with Mary and Martha? And Why weren't you here with us and, and, and comforting us? And Jesus replies, your brother will rise again. Now Martha, who is a faithful follower of Christ, knows that, that or thinks that Jesus is talking about, yeah, when the resurrection comes, the, the very last day, yeah, Lazarus will, will rise again. Okay, I get that. I know that. You've told us that. But Jesus says, I will rise him today because I and the resurrection, and I am the life, and where I am, you will be resurrected. See, Martha had thought about the possibility of the resurrection in the end of times. She had thought about the possibility of the resurrection as this far-off goal, as this far-off thing, this thing that we set in front of us that we, we have to work our way into, just like we talked about in our first sermon. That we as Christians, we sit here and we, we make this checklist saying, all right, if I do this, I'll get to heaven. If I do this, I'll get to heaven. If I, if I sit here in church today, I'll get to heaven. If I go on a mission trip, I'll get to heaven. And then we hand in that piece of paper and we say, all right, here's my ticket to heaven. Martha is thinking one step ahead. 
He says, I know Lazarus is in heaven. I'm checking off those boxes. But Jesus Christ says, I am the resurrection, and I am the life. See, that's what happens to so many of us. We believe in the resurrection. We believe that a time far, 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 far away that we will be resurrected. But how far is it off, really? And that can make a lot of us a little uncomfortable. It can make a lot of us a little uncomfortable. Um, has anyone read like a lot of the conspiracy theories that, that like the seven signs are, are happening right now? That some of this political corruption and like all this environmental stuff, like, like this is, could be the end of times, and that maybe makes us a little bit uncomfortable. Now some of those guys are nuts jobs, I'll just tell you that straight up right now. But the fact that, that some of those things could maybe just a little bit possibly be true, it makes us a little uncomfortable. It makes us want to say, hey, you're a nut job, because we don't want to accept that the resurrection could be closer than we ever imagined. And that doesn't give us comfort because we don't feel like we've checked all those check boxes. Maybe we've checked them all to get to heaven, but then what? We try to comfort ourselves by, by thinking these thoughts. Now, as a pastor and dealing with, with many of you who have lost some ones, I, I hope not to uh, offend anyone that who, is, who has said something similar to this, but, but some, sometimes I hear things like, I know Grandpa is looking down on us right now. Or sometimes we hear things that, that maybe Uncle Bill is, is still in us, in his spirit. His spirit is still with us. Or maybe Jake is playing baseball in heaven. We say things like this because we truly, truly do not believe in the power of the resurrection. So we want to put this time in between where our, our loved ones and those who have passed are doing these things. Like they're, they have the, some subnatural um, ability to still watch over us or still be playing and doing those things um, with us. Maybe mom's baking a cake for Jesus right now. We say these things because the power of the resurrection, when we believe Jesus Christ is the resurrection in life, has not really fully come into comprehension with us. Now, I can't say what's going on in heaven right now. I, just like you, have many theories. I think it's one big party where everyone's singing and dancing and having all kinds of fun. But here's the one thing I do know. I know there's no suffering in heaven. I know that if mom and dad and, and were looking down on us, they would be missing us. And when you're missing someone, you're suffering. See, I know we want to put the spirituality that the spirits are with us in some sort of presence. The one thing that I can say is that there's comfort in heaven. I can say that there's no actual way we can see into this picture of heaven, but I can actually say that Jesus Christ is the resurrection and Jesus Christ is the life. So with that promise, we will again see our loved ones. We will again walk with them and talk with them and laugh with them and touch them and feel them that through the resurrection, we will again see them. I remember taking long trips uh, to my grandma's house in Hayward, Iowa. It's not so long anymore, but, but where I was growing up as a kid, it was about a two and a half hour drive. And I would take these long trips, and the whole time I was excited to see Grandma and Grandpa meeting me at the door and how much love and that, that feeling of that first hug. I do know that that, that is how heaven will be. When the people that we love, the resurrected, will meet us, and there'll be love. No sorrow, no pain, but love. And that's how we should think about them today. Like it's that long drive where we anticipate that love, that, that first hug, the, the, the feeling of their arms of a, a missed one around us. During our time here, we should become acquainted with death in a broken world, but not fear. 
See, our plants die, our pets die, the people all around us will die. We become acquainted with death through these things. We know and experience death through, through death all around us. Now, I myself have come close to dying three times in my life. And when, I, when I'm saying close, I mean close, like close. And in each one of those times, it wasn't easy to accept it. It wasn't easy. Like, if you've been in a really, really, really bad car accident, and you think, man, how did I make it out of there? It's a little bit hard to swallow. It's a little bit hard to think, I could have died. It ain't pretty, but we, we accept it. Why? Because the world has done that to us. The world has made us to, to have this feeling that, that death is just a part of our lives. We feel like we are handed something. We are, we are tied up when it comes to death. But in all this, we think that there's nothing left once death comes. That there's nothing left to do for anything around us once death comes. Because we, as humans, have been taught that death is final. See, in the reality of this, is I've seen my grandpa's body prior or after his death, prior to his funeral. I know that it decomposed, and I know that it turns into ashes. Or maybe we prefer not even to think of that. Maybe we, we think that if we, we unbury a loved one, that miraculously the coffin would be empty. Or, or maybe you even think that the body will be in perfect form. But I know for a fact that's, that's not what happened. But here's something that is cool, though. The same God, the same God that made man out of dust, the same man that designed our lives, he can and will take that decomposed dust that sits below the ground. And on his day that he chooses, he will reconstruct that person just how we know them. He will reassemble them in love. And the whole point in that is that Jesus is coming to us. If we didn't know that, Jesus went to came in the first place. He came to reverse what humans have done. Humans have made death. Through Adam and Eve's sin, death came into the world. Jesus Christ came to us in the world to reverse all that. So Jesus Christ will reverse death again. That's a promise given to us. It's not symbolic. Jesus Christ came to fix death. He didn't come because, because there was some really awesome looking guy with this flowing hair and this ripped body and he had all of these parables and really cool stories. He didn't come just because of that. He didn't come because he wanted to tell all these people good stories and make them laugh and, and give them all this wisdom and metaphors. He came to reverse what man had done. He came to fix the sins. He came to be suspended on a cross. He came to enter a grave. And he came to rise again. We all will take up our own cross. We all will die our own death. We will all enter a grave or maybe a cremation. But when we follow the image of Christ, when we follow in the footsteps of Christ, we again will all be resurrected. Before Winston Churchill died, he became a follower of Christ as well. And he planned out his whole funeral. So on the day of his funeral, and he was at St. Paul's Cathedral, and there's these, if you've never seen St. Paul's Cathedral, there's these domes on top of it, right? And on the far left dome was a bugler. And as they were doing the, the funeral um, process, one of the buglers began to play Reveille, which, um, or sorry, Taps. One of the buglers began to play Taps. So uh, Taps is the, the closing, if you're in the army, is, is the final song of the day. It means the closing of the day. So one bugler began to play 
taps over here, and just as they finish, there was a moment of pause, and on the other side, a bugler began to play Reveille, which is the awakening of the day. And this was symbolic for Winston Churchill because he believed that as one thing dies, new creation is made over here. He was saying good night over here, but good morning over here. Because Winston Churchill knew that there was victory in death and that it would bring new life. That soon his friends, his family, his loved ones, they too would be reunited with them. Now I grew up on 39381 263rd Avenue. I work on 123 First Avenue, First Street. I think we're on a street here. And I know that someday when I die for a short period, I'll probably live on lot three, strip four, however they mark the cemeteries. I know I'll have an address then. And if God delays the second coming, that's where I'll be for a little while. We all have an address. We all have a place where we, we think we'll be in life. But not for a second do I think that that's where I'll remain for the entirety. I will live and be alive more than ever again, and my hope is in the victory over death, not based on the life I lived. It's totally awesome to think that this view is based on a Savior, a Savior that said, I am the resurrection, and I am the life. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for being the resurrection and life, and I thank you for being new creation and new life. And I thank you that, that through all this we can get to this point where we realize that, that death is not the end and heaven is not the end, but the resurrection. And that through that we will again be reunited in love, that we will again have a sin-free world, a world that you created. Jesus Christ is the resurrection, and he is the life, and he fills our world with love. So heaven come down. Lord, I ask you this in your name. Amen.